Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I have this crazy British American accent going on. I am a Brit, but I have developed an American twang. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I say data instead of data. So um, the, the two of us are going to do a, a quick presentation, just as a quick introduction. So my name is Steve Topman. I'm one of the su subject matter experts. So Cloudera has a set of these vertical uh, oriented SMEs. I mainly look after financial services. Prior to Cloudera, um, which is probably more interesting in terms of my background for this talk, um, I was at a company called Ardent, which became Essential and became IBM, uh, around a product called Data Stage. And I built out a lot of IBM stack around data governance. So they have a tool called Business Glossary and Metadata Workbench, which were all my kind of babies there. Um, so spent a lot of time in data governance. And then my colleague today. My name is Murthy Mithipakasam. I'm from Informatica. Um, I've been all over the United States, so I don't even know if you can tell what my accent is. <laughs> but I did it in the East Coast as well. Uh, but like Stephen, um, I've worked with uh, public sector and private sector clients uh, on a variety of data projects. So really excited to be here. I think this is going to be an awesome session. All right, so this is especially interesting to do this session here. Um, and we're going to be using a lot of different terms. So data governance as a whole, I think we have to define. But I first wanted to start with the, the word metadata. So we're going to be talking about metadata a lot, and I kind of wanted to set some ground rules. So being a Brit, this can is very important to me. And you know, various analogies have been made around how data is like the new oil, but data is like food. And if you have a can of food, how do you know what's in it? This could be dog food, which is probably not something you'd choose to eat, or it could be something much more interesting. So metadata is like the wrapper around the can. It's what tells you what is inside. So here in the US, your comfort food seems to be mac and cheese out of those cardboard packets and pizza. Back home in the UK, comfort food is baked beans. Um, it's your standard meal. You have it on toast as a kid. And when you get your can of Heinz baked beans, there's a bunch of stuff on the can that tells you what's inside. It tells you it's made by Heinz. They've got what, 57 other varieties of beans they apparently do. It tells you the variety, the volume. It tells you when it was made, when it was best used by. That's what metadata is to data. It tells you what you're consuming and how important it is. And I'd much rather have good metadata so that I know when I'm actually eating dog food or, or baked beans. So within an enterprise, there are different layers of metadata. Um, the first layer of metadata is business metadata. So we all have a language we use inside the business. Um, they call these taxonomies, ontologies, but it's basically the language you use day to day to define the business value. Um, within that, there's also a layer of technical metadata. Um, there's you know, schemas on databases, so rows and columns. There's a table definition of you know, how that data is structured. And then, of course, uh, you know, some of the newer techniques use much more flexible tables. There's a BI report. A lot of times you're dealing with executives, and their only interaction with the data is what the report is called. Um, there are applications that sit above the data as well. And then there's this final layer of operational metadata. This is actually what actually happens at runtime. So the technical metadata defines what is meant to happen. The operational metadata defines what actually happens. And these three layers together give you an incredible view of what's in the information that you're looking at, how valuable it is, where it came from. And you know, good metadata makes all the difference about the data you're consuming. So what about data governance? So data governance is basically a set of principles and, and, and processes about how you manage and use data and the related metadata. Um, within the data governance, there are three key areas. The people that enforce and, and describe and, and basically carry out the governance process, the process that they're going to adhere to, and the technology that enables it. In reality, the technology is actually a very small piece of this. But what's really interesting is these layers all combine. And you know, within this stack, so I've got a little diagram of the Cloudera data hub at the bottom. We sit in the technology layer. But it's the people and process which actually takes most of the time and energy in these enterprises. Now, ethics. So ethical usage of data depends on the people involved and the situation that they're using the data in. Um, I really do like this quote. Um, this is from a Gartner analyst back in 2012. And he basically was describing how, um, as data is being used for personalization, there is a point when you cross a line, the creepy line. 
So there is good data, and, and there is a point when you cross that line when it becomes a little too creepy. Um, and what's really interesting is how you perceive data to be creepy is dependent on your age bracket. So if you look at the younger generation, millennials grew up in this world where they're very used to data being shared on social media and other devices. Um, in fact, you're also seeing a generation now where they're growing up where everything is shared. In fact, their parents probably shared photos of their birth before they were born on social media. So it's a very interesting world they're growing up in. And they seem very unworried about that, you know, the level of shared data that's going on. Then there's an older generation, which I would consider myself in, where we're a little more sensitive and careful about data usage. And then there's the generation older than us. Now, what's really interesting about the definition of privacy and what is creepy is, is very dependent on your age, but at the same time, you have to be able to judge creepiness. And a good way of judging creepiness is not what you think and not what your you know, youngsters and children think because they grew up in a different world, but what your parents think. Um, Obviously, this isn't really my mom and dad, but <laughs> when you're thinking about you know, how creepy is data, always try and think about what would my mom and dad think about this? How would they feel if the data about them was used in a certain way? And the really good news is there's been a lot of uh, academic research and there's a lot of good toolkits and methodologies you can use to think about this. I really like this. So, so this was uh, created in the 1990s by a commissioner up in uh, uh, Toronto. And she came up with these seven core principles of privacy. So the first principle is, is that privacy should be proactive. You shouldn't think about it in retrospect. You shouldn't be reactive. It should be thought about in advance. Privacy should be the default. Whenever you think about sharing data, you by default, the, the standard um, mode of operation should be that you don't share it uh, without permission or authority. It should be embedded in the design from the ground up through the technical layers. It shouldn't be an afterthought. The entire system should be designed around privacy. This positive sum, not zero sum, is basically when you think about privacy, you should look at the benefits it brings and not think it is a, a compromise point. Um, End-to-end -end security lifecycle. We talked a little bit about you know, the millennials. Data is going to exist, and metadata is going to exist for even longer than that around the data itself. It's going it to exist beyond our lifetime. So we have to start thinking about what happens when we die with the data we've created. How is it curated? Because things that we do will affect our children and their children as well. Um, you must have a, a sort of a complete sort of security layer around this. You must be very transparent. As you come up with these rules and regulations, you must share them in internally. And finally, respect for users. Always think about the user first. The system should be designed from that, designed from that point. Um, now, I wanted to share a little uh, real example. So several years ago in the UK, I was involved with a telco. Um, and this telco had a brand new network, and they had a bit of a reputation about having drop calls. So what would happen is people would have a drop call, and they would call into their call center and say, hey, I've had drop calls. They had no way of knowing which customers had drop calls. So by default, they would give them a five pound voucher every time they called in. What very quickly happened is people sort of started to learn this, that if they called in every day, said they had drop calls, they would get a five pound voucher. So very quickly, people started playing the system. So we worked with them to build this system called the Network Intelligence System. And it was basically just to track all of the drop calls across their network. Vast volumes of data, lots of complexity. But the second the system went live, they basically turned it on their call center, and people called in. So I call in. I'm expecting my five pounds that I get calling in every day. I, I call in. Hello, Mr. Topman. Um, hi, I've had several drop calls. Actually, Mr. Topman, you haven't had any drop calls. You've had perfect service. So they started to eliminate from their customer base these people who were playing the system. The problem was, in the first instance, they actually started to use it with real active customers who were having drop calls where they were genuinely having a droppage. So I would call in and say, hey, I'm, I'm Steve. I'm just, and they would cut me off and say, actually, Mr. Tom, we've noticed you've had several drop calls. Yesterday, you were driving along the M4. You were between two cell towers on Junction 7 and Junction 8. Just to let you know, before they would let them finish, they would be like, you're tracking where I was? You know where I was on the network? You know, you know where I'm driving? So they very quickly learned that you know, how you use the data has to be shared carefully. So what they did is in the call centers, they would just tell them how many drop calls they were, not where they were, and just say, we're working on cell towers you know, in this sort of area. So 
they very quickly learn. And just as a, a humorous fact, the most drop calls in the UK, there's a large tunnel to the, uh, you know, the east of London, the most drop calls were as people went into the tunnel. And they didn't seem to understand why being underwater for, two, you know, for a mile and a half would, would end up in a drop call. It also inspired them to start running uh, cell towers through the, uh, through the system. So it's a good example of how you kind of cross that creepy line where you have data. It's incredibly valuable to some people inside your organization, but you've got to be careful how you share it. They learned the hard way. I mean, thinking about this up front is, is a good way to do it. So another one of our customers is MasterCard. Uh, MasterCard actually came up with a PCI standard. Um, I've had the fortune of working with these guys for about 18 months. Um, they came to us almost two and a half years ago and said, you know, we have this Hadoop cluster. We want to take it through the PCI standard. Um, MasterCard was one of the founders of that standard. It's kind of like your mum and dad being driving instructors and watching you do a driving test. They really want you to pass. They want you to pass first time. There is absolutely no cheating. Um, as a result, the product is, um, Cloudera's product has evolved a great deal. Um, we, we've actually been through two full PCI audits with them now. Um, they have about 10 petabytes on a fully PCI compliant hub. And they actually internally are one of the most sophisticated customers I've seen thinking about data privacy. Obviously, given where they sit, that that's, you know, makes sense. Um, so these are some of the rules they use internally. So, um, I, I won't go into too much detail on all of them, but they're good foundational rules. So anytime you bring in data, understand the legal usage of it. Um, we did a presentation at Strata on you know, what's legal and what is right, which is kind of like you know, in any organization, there are legal pieces about how you can use data, which vastly differ by country. Um, some of you may have noticed recently that Russia basically said you can't take data out of country. We've had a whole bunch of uh, customers suddenly having to put nodes in region because they can no longer take the data out. So there are regional pieces. The same in Australia. In Canberra, you cannot take data out of that state. So there are regional uh, variances around that data. So you have to understand the legal piece. Um, anytime you bring in data, you need to do a degree of a risk assessment about what, how you're storing it. Um, in general, store data in a sensitive way um, on a higher priority system. Uh, one of the really interesting things about Cloudera is we have a partnership with Intel. Um, they invested a great deal of money in Cloudera, but more interestingly, you know, we get access to their roadmap. We've been doing th things at the chip level in terms of encryption. So instead of you doing it in the software, you can do it at the chip level. So instead of a 20 to 30 percent cost on encrypt and decrypt, it's two to three percent. So encrypt everything. Um, you should be fully aware of what data you're storing and how it relates to the individuals. Um, you should be looking at securing it for uh, you know, the use case around the data. So for example, inside MasterCard, anytime you want to use data, you have to go to a team which basically you say what data you want, how you're going to use it, where you're going to use it. They have a team of lawyers go through this, and they're building up a whole set of rules in, about this internally. Um, and just one of the really interesting things I've noticed. So, Chief data officers are now the norm in organizations. When I first got into this industry sort of 15 years ago, data was not so much of an asset as something people were beginning to discover. Now they have CDOs, but what I'm noticing is these CDOs are starting to talk about the ethical piece. And they're actually, if you look at the job descriptions, they're looking for people with not just compliance backgrounds, but sort of the, the sort of legal and ethical side as well. So that's a really nice change that we're seeing. Now, we talked a little bit about security, you know, talking about MasterCard, but it's not just insider threats and outsider threats. It's, it's across your organization. And in fact, most data breaches come from internal users, not external users. So there's obviously a huge threat service outside. But if you look at many of the high profile security breaches, they came from individuals sharing information out. And these are becoming much more sophisticated the bad guys are getting much better at knowing what the limits of the existing systems are and how to work around them. Uh, a lot of these organizations use SIMs, security information event management systems, and SIMs are breaking with the volume of data. And the bad guys know that these SIMs can only store 90 days worth of data, so they'll come in every 91 days. So there's a huge opportunity there as well. And on a side note, you'll see it in some of the other sessions, we've been doing some really interesting stuff around security. Um, there's actually an, an open model that we've worked together with uh, several organizations to create. So that's a very interesting area too. But 
when you think about data security, especially big data on Hadoop, you have to be very aware of the security model. Um, so we worked with uh, the Moscow Advisors team and the Intel team to come up with a security maturity model. Um, so there are levels in this maturity model. If you take open source Hadoop out of the box, um, you know, there's, there's very limited security inside there. Uh, you can configure some degree. The, the next level, level one, you basically put on the basic security controls. Level two, you start getting to the more managed layer with security and governance in there, things like Cloud Air Navigator and Sentry. But level three, you can completely lock down a cluster. You can fully encrypt the data. You can get through a full PCI audit through this as well. So there is a great point you can get to. There are three data points I love to talk to with customers about this. The first data point is where they think they are. Everyone loves to think they're between level one and two. The second is where they really are. Most customers aren't really thinking about this in the beginning and have started at level zero. And the third is where you can get them to. We actually have a, a joint offering with MasterCard Advisors where they'll help you get ready to go through a full PCI audit. Um, and it's a really interesting process. I mean, the technology piece is a small piece of the process and the, the, uh, the, uh, the people and process layers above this. So I'm gonna pass over and uh, we'll go back and forth a little bit, I think, but uh, I think uh, it should be an interesting discussion. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You know, every time Stephen presents that slide about the uh, millennials and the age discrepancies, I'm like so glad that smartphones weren't around when I was in college. So <laughs> I'm not really sure how kids do it these days, or maybe they're just more responsible uh, or, or not. I don't know. But uh, my name is Murthy Mithi Prakasam. So uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I'm, so I'm from Informatica. I'm a principal product marketing manager there. And uh, this is actually my second year uh, coming to the Cloudera uh, event here. I think it's just a fantastic event. I hope everybody here is enjoying the event. And uh, what I want to do is just to share some of our perspectives and some of the experiences that we've had also as another technology vendor. Because uh, this is a very fascinating topic for a number of reasons. I think the people in this room are probably more on the forefront just by the nature of the work that you do and the fact that everything you do inherently touches citizens. Uh, the, these issues of ethics, these issues of governance are very, very important. And um, you know, obviously, you know, vendors like Cloudera and Informatica can have your back on the technology side, but there's, there's a broader discussion here as well. So one of the things I think you know, every, this is just another take on the whole maturity framework concept, right? Um, the, the key thing here is to think about big data as you know, both a great thing or like one of the most awful things in the world, which is that the difference between whether it's gonna become an asset for you or a liability is precisely what we're talking about today. It is governance. Because if you don't have the right controls, if you don't have a loose and lightweight uh, set of processes, this can quickly balloon you know, out of control. And the great thing is most organizations recognize this because there is a history in the industry for data governance. So there's some way to adapt some of those processes. This isn't like you have to start from scratch. But it's important to understand why this is so important. Because the difference literally about you know, taking something like big data and getting the maximum value out of it is all going to come down to how you do some of these data management practices. Now, so there's this whole question about is the data getting kind of out of control? And Stephen touched on you know, the whole creepiness factor. <clears throat> so these are a couple of my personal sort of uh, observations on this. And I don't even know if, uh, how many of you are familiar with this. So the first uh, picture here, it's a screenshot from an iPhone. I don't know if everybody here knows, but did you know your iPhone actually tracks where you are? And there's actually a screen in there where it'll go back and tell you for the last 60 days, all the places, and it'll plot it on you know, uh, Apple Maps, exactly where you've been. And it's a feature that's turned on by default and you have to go in and turn it off if you don't want Apple watching everywhere you're going. So, I mean, this is a great example of what Steven was saying. You know, I mean, I guess on one hand, it's maybe a little bit useful because presumably that information is getting used to somehow improve your experience in some way. I'm not exactly sure how, but uh, you, know, you do wonder where's all that information kind of going and who, you know, hopefully it's staying on your phone. You know, if, if it gets out, you know, what's, what's gonna happen there? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if for anybody who uses Facebook, if you've ever, been kind of scrolling through your feed and all of a sudden you'll see an ad for something that you had searched on outside of Facebook because Facebook has these beacons that they kind of throw around the web and so they can actually tell if you went to Amazon or some other shopping site and you're looking for something or even just based on your profile because you've given them everything about yourself on Facebook they know your gender and your age category and all that you start to see these really really hyper personalized ads and you know sometimes I mean it's useful sometimes you know you get that creepiness factor that Stephen was talking about this uh, last one's kind of interesting. You know, so we're in this cycle of the presidential election. I got a phone call just a couple weeks ago. It was one of these pollsters, because like, I think this whole polling industry is like, kind of gotten out of hand. 
But um, they called me, but this is very specific. So they called my cell phone and they said, hi, we're doing a poll on how Asian Americans are perceiving you know, different political issues. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what database out there has my name, my cell phone number, and Asian American after it? <laughs> like, how do they know that? I mean, I guess my name might kind of give it away, but like, how did they figure this out, right? Like, how are they able to target at that level, uh, you know, all these things? And so this is sort of where you, in these issues, I mean, everybody in this room is in a position to affect some of these types of issues. And so it is worth, you know, putting that thought that Stephen was talking about in terms of how, you know, you're going to approach the use of data. So this is sort of one way that I think of, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're in the public sector here, right? So it's, you know, we like to talk about missions. And I think the mission that everybody in this room has is to be able to deliver, you know, these data solutions to your organizations, uh, but, you know, but also define and enforce this notion of governance. It's very, very important, again, for, in terms of, you know, being able to ensure you can ensure trust, making sure you can, you know, protect and track the data. All this stuff is very, very important if you want to get maximum value and also avoid all the, the bad news type of things that could possibly happen. Now, you've seen this, this chart again. You know, Stephen presented it. Um, I, I think it's fairly obvious here. You know, the, the point to this slide is just the idea that it's not just a technology problem. Technology is there to aid the process, but you really do need to have a holistic program around data governance that you know, is facilitated by technology, but it really comes down to how you engage your people and how you're engaging processes. So one of the first things that I think is important, and I think, again, the public sector is generally a little bit more advanced than this stuff. Uh, the private sector, uh, maybe, you know, depending on the organization, you know, catches up. But it's this idea of a code of ethics. Like, what is responsible use for data? And, you know, you're starting to see more and more organizations really start to get very specific about what this means. Because you do want to, on some level, provide autonomy to end users to, to get access to data. That's a good thing. That means your agency, your organization is becoming more and more data driven. But, you know, as Stephen said, with power comes responsibility. And so defining what does responsible use even mean is one of the most basic steps that you can take to ensuring, you know, responsible use. Another part of the process side of things, and, you know, some of this, it sounds like, oh my God, we got to really go through like standards committees and taxonomies and all this. And, you know, we're talking about really, really lightweight types of things here. This, is, this doesn't have to be some three year long process, but just define a, a couple of things. Think about who's you know, involved in the governance process, who's, who has the right controls, what, what are the standards that we're gonna establish, what are the, you know, how do we organize our data as we're bringing it into systems like Hadoop or other systems outside of Hadoop. Just put some basic structure in place. And then also, th this isn't something you do once, it's an ongoing process, because as new data comes in or as there's new regulations. I mean, you need to kind of keep this very, very evolutionary. And so the most successful organizations have figured out a way to make governance agile. And that's actually very, very important because one of the other ways that you can get kind of lost in these things is when you end up doing the two-year process, going through and defining everything. And by the time you're done, you know, requirements have changed and you got to redo it. And so the key is to be able to do this in a very, very lightweight and agile way. It still accomplishes the goal. But it, it also keeps you flexible and nimble, and that's very, very important, especially as you think about the volume of data, the velocity of the data that's coming in. Uh, you know, you don't want the process to be a bottleneck, you want it to be an enabler of, of capturing that value. Another thing that's really, really fascinating with the whole idea of Hadoop is, and you've probably heard this idea of a data lake. It's a very, very powerful notion, because in general, as you know, most data professionals, we're kind of used to a classical way of thinking about data and data management. It's very rigid and very structured. But one of the things that's really, really cool about Hadoop is the fact that you don't actually have to put in place the maximum amount of structure. And you can actually just land data inside of Hadoop and start using it immediately. And this itself is a form of agility that can enable different types of uses of data by different users. So this also comes back to the idea of really thinking about who needs access to what and at what time. Because what we're seeing is that even the idea of governance roles can shift between different people in the organization. So maybe there are some people who have higher grades of access to data, and you don't have to mask the data and secure it as much from those users because they actually have privileged access, whereas there are other users who uh, you know, require a little bit more scrubbing, a little more securing because of their access. And so you start to think about these notions of security and governance uh, in a way that's more contextual. And this is something you couldn't necessarily do with traditional data platforms. But now because Hadoop has this inherent flexibility, it enables a tremendous more flexibility in how you think about governance in your organization as well.
Actually, so I have to be honest, I hate the word data lake. Um, <laughs> so I, I was actually at a, a Federal Reserve Summit, and an analyst presented before me. And um, I, I had no idea he also didn't like data lakes. Um, and he basically pointed out that without security and governance, a data lake very quickly becomes a swamp. And I think it's a very important piece. Um, Cloudera is actually very careful. We talk about a data hub. So we don't want it to become a lake where you kind of deposit stuff in a, a depository. We want it to become an active part of your organization. So it's just a very personal thing. But yeah, data lake is a term that I hear a lot. And every time it, it makes my skin crawl. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good point because I, it's, it's the idea of balancing flexibility with uh, in the right yeah. amount of structure. Um, because you know, uh, we all know the traditional world of data management hasn't been known for its flexibility. And so fl Hadoop offers the benefit of a little bit more flexibility without the loss of the, the elements of governance that really, really matter. So these are just a couple quotes. I'm not going to read through uh, these things. These are things that we've actually heard from different customers of Informatica's. And you kind of get this, this sense about the, the hardest problems that people are facing around data it's not the technology stuff. That's the stuff that you know, vendors have got solutions for you. You can get that out of the box. It's all these other things that you know, people are asking about. Well, man, like data management's really labor intensive. Like I can't have armies of people. Who, you know, as big data gets bigger, I can't have bigger organizations go with it. It's, you've got to have some way to scale. Uh, you've got to have ways to make things reusable and maintainable. And so these are the types of problems that technology can help facilitate. But you know, it's coupled with the people and process side of things as well. And so I, mean, I think we've kind of covered this, right? I mean, I think this is something that, uh, I mean, sometimes it's worth stating, because I think there's still a lot of people who think, well, big data is something that seems really easy to do, so I'll just get you know, two or three people you know, in a little pet project, and we'll make it all happen. Well, the issue with that is, again, it's all these things at the bottom. Everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the whole notion of big data. It's going to get bigger. And so if you're going to have more volume a year from now or two years from now, you're going to have more variety, more velocity. If everything you know predictably that the data environment that you're facing today is going to seem trivial to you two or three years from now. And it's going to be exponentially bigger and more complex. Now, knowing that, how do you, you know, have the foresight and how do you think about how you design these processes and systems? And so fundamentally, we've, we have not seen a whole lot of organizations who have tried to tackle these problems purely through brute force. There's some aid of technology. There's some aid of process. All these things are inevitable, perhaps even more so than in the traditional world of data management. because. With the, the traditional world, you know, you cut a couple of SQL developers and, you know, they could somehow kind of hack through things. In a way, the fact that the data was so structured enabled you to maybe get away with a little bit of sloppiness. Now with the world of big data, there's a lot of opportunity, but to actually harness that opportunity, it does take a little bit of thought. We talked about the trust issues too. So, you know, as your agency, you're looking at new sources of data, they may not be coming from the classical relational data sets. And so, the data sometimes isn't that great. Uh, we have a lot of private sector organizations who are trying to ingest social media data, for example, to get a you know, better view of what customers are thinking and things like that. People don't tweet very well. You know, they, there's misspellings. There's, the, the data just isn't of very high quality. Uh, anything that a human being basically enters into like a web form or anything like that, the minute a human is the one entering the data, there's going to be errors. So there's going to be data challenges. And so uh, it's good that we're able to actually engage with, you know, our, our stakeholders in a much more uh, closer way, but it also means that your ability to trust that data becomes more challenged, and you need some way to deal with that. If you actually want to extract some of these relationships from these new data sets, you need systems and processes to do that. And obviously, everybody's familiar with these you know, regulations, and this is just basically a, a, you know, a simple subset here. So uh, there, this is list frankly, will continue to grow for all the reasons that Stephen was saying. It's very regional as well. And so different uh, you know, areas are going to have to deal with different regulations. And that's something that, uh, for, for a good reason as well, these are all intended to protect the end users. Uh, you know, we know that security, the traditional approach to security, just don't work for the world of big data anymore. I mean, you really have to actually understand the data and have some context for the data to protect it. You can't just put a big firewall around and say, well, I guess nobody should have access to it, because then you're kind of in this world of either everybody has unlimited access or nobody has any access. And that, that's not really enabling you to maximize the value of the data. So you need contextual security systems that understand the data and can say, OK, well, this is sensitive because it's got personally identifiable information. That's the stuff we want to be a lot more careful about. Then maybe there's some other data sets. OK, that, this isn't sensitive. Let, they, you know, we can have more pervasive access to that. So having that context is very important. And uh, you know, there's also bigger you know, risk 
footprints here, just given the kinds of data that people are trying to bring in. So it's a uh, you know, very similar uh, point here. And again, it's, it's the whole idea of how do you scale? Because if you think about maybe you might have a good handle of the data you have in your system today, but imagine everything's growing exponentially. Is there a point when you might actually have more data than your team can actually handle? So how do you start to automate those processes and have the technology identify for you, oh, wait, there's some data here that you need to go take a look at. Maybe you need to secure it. Maybe you need to siphon it off. And you know, in the end, like, all this kind of has real impact in the public sector. You know, in the private sector, maybe it's a couple points of profitability or maybe it's a little bit of bad press. But when you think about like, what this actually means in a government context, it's actually quite bad. And so this is another reason why I think the people in this room have the biggest opportunity to really push the forefront of this whole space. Because there's no other industry you know, besides public sector where you're so closely, everything that you do you know, so closely affects and touches real citizens. And so being able to address these concerns actually can maximize the value of the data that you have and enable you to deliver better services. And it can prevent all of the kind of adverse impacts that can potentially happen as you start to deliver these types of data-driven services. So it, just a quick, you know, you gotta have a little in, infomercial in there somewhere. So just a quick, you know, view of our uh, uh, pro product portfolio. And obviously you can go back to our, uh, our booth area and, and get some more information about this. But basically the way we think about big data is we have a data management solution for big data. It covers a lot of the things that we've talked about today uh, and, and more, uh, but it's basically organized around data integration, data governance and quality, and data security for big data. And we have a solution that runs right on top of Cloudera. We're fully integrated um, application, yarn based and everything. And uh, we're also going to be introducing a new tool th this year, actually in a couple weeks. Uh, it's, right now it's codenamed Project Sonoma, but it's a way to do self-service access to data as well. And this is something that's very new, uh, but one of the things that's unique is that it's fully integrated with our governance and quality. So one of the challenges with things like self-service, I mean, this is like one of these things that anybody who's involved in data governance and they hear the word self-service, they freak out. Like, what? <laughs> who's getting access to what data? You want to just push it out there? Well, our solution is gonna be completely integrated with governance policy. So you can actually give people, literally the right people, the right access at the right time. And I mentioned that we are integrated with Cloudera and we're also one of the few vendors who has an integration with the Cloudera Navigator tool. So I mean, if you want to provide a quick overview of Navigator. Yeah, so, so firstly, there's something called data lineage. Um, and the best way to describe data lineage is, imagine you've got a street with three different restaurants, an English restaurant, very popular here in the US, a Chinese restaurant, and a French restaurant. Um, people are eating in the restaurant all the time. You go around to the back behind the restaurants where they throw out all the trash, and they want you to go through the trash and figure out what people were eating in the restaurant. That's a pretty difficult thing to do, but that's effectively what Data Lineage is doing. You've got to dig through all this metadata from all these applications and figure out the flow of data through those systems. Um, and in Hadoop, it's very different. I'm sure you'll hear through all the talks, there are two things that are really important about Hadoop. The first is the cost point. It's a completely different cost point. The second is the schema on read, schema on need nature. In a traditional data warehouse, you define the schema up front and the schema you know, controls everything. In Hadoop, you can put the data in, literally sort of throw it in, and then apply the schema flexibly on read or need time. You still have to pay the price of applying the schema at some point, but you can ingest data in a much more flexible manner. That means that for metadata, it's incredibly complicated because you have to understand what happened to the data all through that path. And to be honest, I mean, two years ago, the reason I joined Cloudera is because Cloudera was just so far ahead with Navigator. Navigator lets you look at that runtime environment and build up the data lineage across that in, uh, that, those pieces. And then Informatica has been a great partner to us because they've plugged their technology in with us. So we provide this incredibly good view about what's going on in the Hadoop layer. And we can literally push it out to them. And they can display it in their UI. So you can get a much more complete uh, lineage workflow. So hopefully that analogy kind of helped. but. It is so important for you to be able to see where the data is, how it moves through the system, and the touch points, and that's what data lineage really means. And a navigator basically provides that view across the Hadoop ecosystem, and then together with Informatica's tool, we can provide it across you know, modeling tools, reporting tools, et cetera. And by the way, this is related to that first slide that I showed. I mean, on one hand, you might think of lineage like, oh, it's just about like compliance and I gotta like, you know, keep track of all the stuff we do and all that. Yeah, there's that piece of it. But lineage can be a very positive thing too. I mean, you, you wanna know what's happening to your data. Ma knowing what's happening to your data might help you find better uses of the information as well. And so a lot of the things we're talking about here, uh, you know, again, this is why I point to this particular audience. I think when we talk about topics like governance, 
I think this audience can appreciate that this is very, very enabling to you know, the things that you're trying to do in your missions, uh, you know, in addition to the fact that it facilitates some of the you know, regulatory and, and kind of other types of requirements. And it really just comes back to this mission, right? It comes back to being able to leverage uh, you know, an ethical policy of governance that actually enables you to deliver great public outcomes. That's really what I think everybody in this room is hopefully aspiring to do. Uh, you know, obviously, Cloudera and Informatica have technology that can help to facilitate that. But you know, there's a broader kind of context to all this as well. And what I want to do is I just want to close with a couple of slides that have talked a little bit about what Informatica has actually done with public sector organizations. Because uh, again, it just gives you a sense. I mean, with a lot of things we've talked about today, it's very good. But I want to just really push this all the way to the end point and just let you see how kind of focusing on data management can actually deliver better public outcomes. So uh, we work with both you know, federal as well as you know, state and local organizations. So the Florida Turnpike, uh, they're trying to collect data about drivers as they go through the, the tolls, right? And understand the patterns of traffic. By understanding those traffic patterns, and you can read the quote there, they can actually think through, well, what's the right way to be thinking about transportation policy? Instead of just kind of having a bunch of lawmakers figure this stuff out on their own, they actually can make data-driven decisions because they're collecting the data and they're processing it, they're managing it, and they're able to actually uh, you know, put in place new programs that can save money. This is real business impact here from using data in a wise way. You think about the environment. You know, how can data influence the environment? So this is the US Geological Service. And they are collecting data from all over the US, obviously. The, the data inherently is distributed. So they have a, a challenge of just getting all that data collected in one central place and analyzing that data. And you can see the quote there for how uh, you know, we've been able to help them as well. Again, this is, you know, there's these outcomes of you know, being able to actually inform policy and execute these public services that are all the better when they're backed by data. Education, a tremendous opportunity here. And uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of innovation in this space because uh, you know, everybody's trying to actually deliver education in more and more innovative ways and actually make sure that the education is delivered effectively at all. And so there's a lot of interesting student data that's out there that is, you know, that students are agreeing to share, obviously, with the university, but it's in a, it gives them a way to actually define how can we deliver a better student experience? How do we keep students from leaving, you know, and um, actually improve student retention rates? I and mean, there's real, real societal impact here from looking at some of these data sets and using it to actually improve people's lives. And obviously, when you think about improving people's lives, the biggest you know, kind of example of that is healthcare. And I think there's a tremendous amount of you know, innovation that's happening uh, in the healthcare space. And uh, I mean, lots of, you know, on the insurance side, on the provider side, uh, as well as the public policy side of things, people trying to just get better information about people, what challenges they have. You know, there's uh, you know, veteran uh, aspects to all this. Uh, so much opportunity to take all the services that we are all trying to provide to the public and just take it to the next level. And I think that's really the opportunity that every single person in this room really has. Like, let's think about data as something that's very, very enabling, not just for each of us as professionals, but let's think of it as something that's enabling for society as a whole. Because we're always trying to find that next edge and how we can make the United States and, and you know, state and local governments better. And I think there's something very, very powerful here in how we can take data, apply some of the processes and the tools that we've talked about today, and really, really help to deliver some really, really exciting new services. So thank you very much. So do you guys have any questions? <laughs> so we have like a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Um, I think they're going to try and come to you with a mic if you give us two seconds. So a lot of what you've been sorry, it's okay. So a lot of what you've been talking about is how you manage data ethically once you've collected it. Um, I was thinking about that school example um, and how the process should go about in how data is collected in the first place, because you do have issues in that particular example where the state of Louisiana was actually opposing a law to track um, student data based on social security number on the idea that it was too much of a breach of personal information. 
So, so there are two pieces to that. Firstly is the ingestion, and the second is the first landing point, how you store it, exactly what data fields you store, and how you basically reference the data between them. So using social security as obviously, you know, it's, it's technically a good thing because it tends to be somewhat unique, though it's not always unique. But, you know, choosing the initial uh, identification point is, is very key. There's a whole bunch of technology uh, that allows you to do sort of data masking, and there's things like obfuscation, which is where you swap out another entity. Um, there's tokenization, where you basically give it a reference but can still go back. So there's a whole sophisticated set of technology around that, where that very first touch point, you immediately anonymize it to some degree. But then you also have to recognize how you segment it that means a huge difference. If there are only three people in a zip code, it's pretty easy to figure out who that person is. So it requires strong upfront profiling of that data. And actually, Informatica has got a great set of tools to do that. Um, and actually, you know, even some of the open source you know, pieces you know, fit very well there as well. So it's a case of ingestion point, figuring out what you're doing, and then the schema that you store the data in it uh, as well is very important. Anything to add? Or? I'll just add one, one thing real quickly, which is you know, data is there to inform policy and to enforce policy. But policy is policy. I mean, you always have to have a conversation uh, about what it is that you think is appropriate and is, is inappropriate. And it's going to be, as Stephen mentioned, very geographically contextual. It's uh, you know, contextual by age group. And so I think every one of these contexts needs to have a policy conversation, and maybe that particular environment has a more stringent set of policy requirements because that's how they think about privacy. Maybe a different geography or a different you know, uh, area is going to have a different set of policy. And so I don't think the data can necessarily decide whether something is ethical or not. But once you've made a decision around what you believe is ethical, it's there to help facilitate that you know, execution of that. Any other questions? Sorry, it's kind of difficult to see with the light. In an earlier presentation, DJ Patil was talking about recourse as a, an area of focus for him. And I'm wondering if you've thought about that in the context of your presentation and just to put a, uh, a point on it. It's one thing to, to have systems where you need the ability to have recourse if, say, the Social Security Administration doesn't accurately know if you're alive or dead. There's a problem, right? What if in, in more analyzed data, there's a system that says, Murthy is trustworthy, but Steve is not. So What's your rec what, what are the governance principles? That, and have you thought about that in terms of how to um, think about those implications of big data analytics? So we're, we're definitely seeing customers struggle with that you know, already. Um, so it is very easy to use data and, and then later consider the impact of that usage. So absolutely, like, you know, because I've got a British accent, I may be less trustworthy than someone who doesn't, you know. Um, so, so, you know, all those things. The other way around. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is very interesting. I mean, we're seeing customers kind of go through that. Um, we've actually, uh, one of the first customers I, I worked with on, on joining Cloudera was a large financial institution that was basically looking across this for uh, compliance reasons, but they really started to look at every piece of data and the, the positive and negative of storing it. The, the reality is, is we are being scored on a massive level, and I would rather have transparency about how that's being used. And one of the nice things about Hadoop is previously, you would have been scored in six different systems. There is the opportunity with a company using Hadoop to bring all that data into a single place. And things like, you know, in the, in the seven principles, one of them is basically eliminate multiple feeds in. You may be, you know, like you were saying earlier in your example about how did they, some of there's a database which tags them in a certain way. That greater degree of visibility is possible. I also think that we're starting to see organizations be more proactive in thinking about it. And actually, it kind of sets uh, my, my, I'm going to go to the last, this last slide first, but. This was kind of my thought. Um, I got this from a customer in Australia. She described it in much more graphical terms, so I've kind of turned it down. Um, but ethical big data is like kissing in the schoolyard, right? Everyone's talking about it. Very few people are doing it, and even fewer are doing it well. The coolest thing about being at Cloudera and working with partners like Informatica is I think we're with the, you know, the customers who are really right at the, the cutting edge here, and we just want to help more people learn about that. So there's a massive opportunity there. Um, 
you have to think about this very carefully. Like, you know, very few organizations, I get super excited when I meet chief data officers. When they suddenly start asking ethical questions, it's like, wow, yes. This, and, but it's, it's happening more and more. So, you know, it may be like kissing in the schoolyard today, you know, it'll evolve to something more um, you know, sophisticated and, and repetitive. But it's our job to do that. That's one of the reasons, and I, DJ's talk, I mean, the fact that the, you know, the White House has a chief data scientist now, that's awesome. And the fact that this is top of mind for him, that again is a good thing. So things start by talking about them. Um, could we go to the, the previous slide? So we have like 30 seconds uh, to go. I, I, I think I, I can, maybe I can do it myself. Yeah. Um, so you're leaving the auditorium today. You've found this interesting. You've now got a slightly better understanding of ethical data. You're going to remember baked beans and, and, and <laughs> take out food. Um, what do you do when you go back to the office? So the first thing is to start inventoring your data. There are tools from vendors like Informatica which do a great job of helping you with that. But at the very least, start figuring out what data you have in your organization. Figure out what frameworks, legal frameworks are being used. The MasterCard guys have a whole team that just look at this across the organization. Start publishing usage guidelines, even if it's on a wiki somewhere internally. And you know, certainly reach out to us at Informatica to help you with this. But you, know, you can do the first two steps on your own. And it, that's the basics, because you don't want the phone call of, you know, we're on the front page of the New York Times because we had a data breach. You know, where's that data being used? You know, it's better to have this plan up ahead. And there was a couple of good quotes. But the first is, like, it's not if you're going to be breached, it's when. And there's a marketing adage that there is no such thing as bad publicity. I would beg to differ. Being on the front pages because your customer data has been you know, lost out there and you have no idea how and where is not a good thing. So there's a real opportunity. Anything else to? Sorry, I got to hog the, uh, the wrap up. No, 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 this is great. I, actually, I think your, your other slide also is a good way to end, because I think to your question also, um, much like the, the analogy that you're making here, nobody necessarily gets it right the first time. <laughs> And that's okay. It's just about understanding, you know, the problem in a way and having some, you know, control around it. And so I don't think this is a space that anybody should be afraid of. Like I said, don't let, keep your eye on the ball about the opportunity. And that's why I wanted to really go through some of those slides on the, the powerful things you can do with data. What we're talking about today is just things that you need to keep in mind to get to that opportunity. But always keep you and your teams focused on that opportunity because there's always more things that we can do with data together. And, and Doug Cutting, so the reason it's called Hadoop, and I'm sure this has come up already, is because he named it after his son's toy elephant. Um, of course, now his kid's 13 and taking credit for this. Doug is here. Like, one of my, the, the, the coolest things about my job is, you know, Mike and Doug really care about this. I mean, Doug, the reason it's open source and Hadoop is because of him. And the reason that Cloudera is here is because of Mike and him. So, you know, they're, they're huge advocates of this as well. So they're, it's very cool to work for such, you know, good leaders. So. Yeah, it's been very interesting. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Uh, it was interesting and uh, you uh, learned a little something and we'll be around for questions if you have any. Thank you very much, guys.